title for this morning's equipping hour is complaining. So at the very beginning, you're not allowed to say anything negative about this message. I will pray for us and we will get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for another Sunday morning. The world has uh, continued its rotation and its orbit around your son. And we are still here. You have not, in your holy justice, uh, ended the human race, uh, but you, by your mercy, have stayed your wrath one more week, one more day, one more hour, uh, that we might contemplate you. We pray, O God, for soft hearts, for yielded lives before you, for genuine faith produced by your Spirit. And we pray as we look at a, a topic that hits close to home, uh, for the, the, the language of complaint is our native tongue. We pray that we would be convicted, encouraged, uh, changed by your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The series during equipping hour has been some biblical counseling, uh, some biblical self-counseling for me that you've been sitting in on. So... Uh, We will continue along these lines, and I'm just going to put before you a topic that needs addressing in my own heart, and and I trust a a topic that will be a benefit to all of us in some measure. Back in July, we spent two weeks looking at contentment, and complaint is the vocal expression of a lack of contentment. Complaining, whether it's in the heart, grumbling under the tongue, grumbling from the lips, under our breath, muttering, or out loud protest, is all a symptom of a lack of contentment. It is the expression of discontent. So in in one sense, uh, we are looking at the flip side of contentment this morning. John Calvin said that murmuring and discontent are as natural to man as thorns are to the soil. You know, when did thorns appear in the soil? Genesis 3, the fall of man occurs. Ever since, soil has been thorny. And likewise, ever since the fall of man, our hearts have been given to complaint. And complaint finds its way out through our mouths. Imagine walking along the beach and spotting a half-deflated life raft being rolled around in the shore break. You wade out, curious to retrieve it, and and it's heavy. Well, it's slightly heavy. Inside is an emaciated, barely conscious, scraggly-haired, sun-blistered, shivering man whose tattered shreds of clothing barely cling to his bony frame. It's clear he's been adrift for weeks, and he has just washed up on shore. You bring him water and food from your picnic lunch, You give him the hooded sweatshirt off your back and you begin to call others in for help. And as he takes a few sips of your water, moistening his lips and throat sufficiently to speak, he says to you, can I get natural spring water instead? With some ice in a glass? Now, I don't like whole wheat bread. Do you have a sweatshirt that doesn't say Dallas Cowboys? And what took you so long to pull me in? That sort of complaining is totally incongruous with a life-saving rescue. Someone who's been adrift for weeks in a life raft, hanging on to the very edges of life, is glad for any drink of water he can get. Complaining is unbecoming in a situation like that. I want us to put ourselves in the in the shoes or the bare feet, as it were, of such a rescued man. What did it mean for you to come to Christ, to believe the gospel, to have your sins forgiven, to have been rescued from your hopeless and helpless state? And then, what is the language that comes out of our mouths ever since? Truthfully, there should not be one syllable of complaint from a heart rescued by the gospel. It is unbecoming. 
So what I want to do this morning is counsel myself with you in my living room via seven questions. Seven questions this morning in an attempt to uproot complaining from our hearts. Let's start with the first question. When am I allowed to complain? When am I allowed to complain? Turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. After my introduction, it sounds like a silly question with an obvious answer. But if I hadn't started with the gospel and our rescue and the unbecoming nature of complaint altogether, we might have been tempted to answer the question, not rhetorical. Well, I can think of a lot of reasons to complain. Man, traffic this morning? (laughs) Fill in the blank with every inconvenience, every hardship, every difficulty. Everything that rubs us the wrong way or isn't exactly what we wanted in the way we wanted it when we wanted it. But Philippians 2.14 is going to give us an indication of a a biblical answer to the question, when am I allowed to complain? Look down at verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. What is the answer to the question? Uh, When am I allowed to complain? Well, do all things without grumbling and disputing, without complaining and arguing. We should say never. I I, I should never be allowed to complain. That, That shouldn't be coming out of a rescued heart. Unless you're to say, well, I, I can complain when I'm not doing anything, since the text says do all things without it. But I think the implication here is, is never. I want to make some observations about Philippians 2 for you for just a moment. Philippians 2 is, is famous not just for the prohibition against complaining in verse 14, but also for the radical humiliation of the second person of the Trinity earlier in the passage. And Paul, enjoining Christians to be humble, says, Have this way of thinking in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, verse 5, who, because he existed in the form of God, didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." So, framing up the conversation about complaining, we're immediately confronted with the context of Jesus' humble, glorious humiliation in the incarnation. What did it mean for the infinite Son of God to become a man, and a man of a low caste, even a form of a slave? That immediately is convicting to us. If anyone had something to complain about, it, it would have been him. Sinless and perfect and ignored, mistreated, maligned, spat upon, beaten, mocked, murdered. And yet he did not open his mouth in such complaints as we are so prone to. And then thinking about Philippians 2, this verse 14 is a command. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. It it is in a sense a prohibition, an an all-encompassing prohibition. There is no situation when complaining is justified or permitted. And then there's a result in verse 15. Did you hear this? So that. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So that you will be blameless and innocent Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. He's not talking about some sort of absolute sinlessness here, but he is talking about the believer's life while still on this earth before glorification. And how will one shine who does not complain? Totally radically different. Different than the rest of the world. If the native language of humanity is complaint, as John Calvin said, then believers who revel in the gospel and have nothing to complain about will look and sound different in a dark world. Our language will be different. Our demeanor will be different. Our facial expressions will be different. Our tone of voice will be different. And so the result of this Following this command is a countercultural testimony. 
a countercultural testimony. That is, a, you are a walking trophy of God's power to make you look fundamentally different than everybody else around you. Say, we both endured the same traffic jam. What's wrong with you? Why are you smiling? Why are you content? Why, are you, why aren't you up in arms? Why aren't you outraged? We are to look different. And then there is a means to this no complaining command. Now it's in verse 16, holding fast the word of life, holding fast the word of life, clinging to the gospel, clinging to the word of God, which brings life in Christ. That is actually the means for doing all things without grumbling and complaining. We're getting ahead of ourselves to the cure, but that is a hint. Let's move to a second question. What does complaining sound like? What does complaining sound like? Complaining is in the heart, under the tongue, barely on the lips, and sometimes broadcast. Uh, Broadcasting comes in different forms. You could get a megaphone and broadcast your complaints. Uh, You could hire a skywriter, you know, an acrobatic airplane with a smoke trail that spells out your messages for all to see. Or worse than both of those, you could use the internet, (laughs) which goes everywhere so quickly. And a complaint can be heard without words. A complaint can be heard visually, with an attitude, a look, a posture, a tone of voice, eyes that roll. We can complain when we give tacit agreement to the complaints of others. We can complain facetiously in a way that's disguised as humor, a rash thrusting of a sword and say, I was just kidding. And nobody really knows how much of the truth was in the joke. And listen, we need to evaluate our hearts coming out through our lips and our faces. And complaining is the natural language of the fallen heart and complaining can easily be the fallback talk of the redeemed the not yet fully glorified heart. And it is so easy to justify. So easy to excuse ourselves thinking we have reasonable excuses to complain. Uh, The two words in Philippians 2.14, grumbling and and disputing, some translations give complaining uh, or arguing. The first word for grumbling is a Automatopoeia, you know, in English, that's a a word that sounds like what it is. Whoosh, kind of sounds like a whoosh. Uh, This word for grumbling, gongozmash, kind of just sounds like a gong, 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 gong. The the, the grumbling, muttering under your breath. Razzle, 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 razzle. You're not quite given to uttering four-letter words through a megaphone, but man, you're, you're thinking stuff, and you're muttering stuff, and, and you're having a conversation in your heart that's sort of leaking out. It's perceptible to those around you, and they say, what did you say? And you're like, oh, everything's fine. That is the word for grumbling. It's indistinct utterances of disapproval. But you have to understand that what is indistinct Barely on our lips is megaphoned in heaven with crystal clarity. God hears it. Here's a couple other texts that use this word. 1 Peter 4, 9, be hospitable to one another without complaint. Uh, Jacob Handla is going to do a three-week equipping hour on hospitality in November. And so he'll... He'll come back to this text. If you were at the women's retreat this year, you you heard this verse, the idea that we are to be hospitable to one another and true hospitality, hospitality is going to manifest itself in not grumbling about it while we're being generous. John 7, 12 uses the same word. There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning Jesus, and some were saying he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. And so you have the, the crowds just doing this grumbling about Jesus. And in John six forty one, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And it's interesting to watch when the crowds complain or the religious leadership argued or grumbled about Jesus in their hearts 
Jesus answered. This is just a lesson for us. Very dangerous to think in the presence of Jesus. Because your thinking in here is out loud conversation with him. The second word in Philippians 2.14 is disputing. It is where we get our English word dialogue. It is the talking back and forth, the arguing, the disputing internally. Thoughts and reasonings of the heart and the mind. And again, God hears every word of it. This word is used in Luke 5.22. Jesus, aware of their reasonings, there's the word, answered and said to them. Jesus was aware of their internal dialogue and he answered it. Luke 6, 8, he knew what they were thinking. Luke 9, 47, Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart. Those words for thinking is the same word for disputing here in our text. Jeremiah Burroughs, in his book, Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, said, the disorders of your hearts and their sinful workings are as words before God. God knows those grumblings. God knows the complaining before it leaks out, before it makes the audience of other people's ears. It has made the ears of heaven. Here's a third question for us this morning. What does complaining reveal about me? What does complaining reveal about me? We know from Jesus that out of the mouth, the heart speaks. And so our words are a window into us. The heart, the mind, the inner workings, the command and control center of who you are. And complaining says something about us. First of all, complaining misreads who we really are and what we deserve. When you are complaining, you are revealing that you have a high view of yourself. That you have a view that you are entitled to things you're not getting. That you deserve things that aren't coming to pass in your life. And turn with me in your Bibles to Lamentations chapter 3. This is the poem, the large acrostic poem that follows the book of Jeremiah. It's also written by Jeremiah. Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. Uh, this masterful piece of literature as he sat on a hill, brokenhearted, overlooking the city of Jerusalem, the, the city he loved, the city that God had set his affections on and the center of his manifest presence. It was the location, geographical location of his promises, and it was under siege. And the people inside had resorted even to cannibalism. All as a judgment of God for his people's rebellion for his people's unbelief. And as Jeremiah pens this really awful depiction, he says in verse 39 of chapter 3, which is just a few verses off of the very center and apex of the book, Jeremiah addresses the heart. He said, Why should any living person or any man complain in light of his sins? And if you were sitting with Jeremiah, looking down on the city as it was being besieged, demolished, and, and people were doing all the awful things that they were doing, and you can read about it there. We would have to agree with Jeremiah theologically. Why are these awful things happening to these people in Jerusalem? Well, nobody gets to complain who has sinned against a holy God. The truth is, nobody on this side of eternity is yet getting what he actually deserves in terms of sin and deserts. As long as you are breathing God's air on this earth, you are getting less than what your sins have earned you. Turn to Romans chapter 6. This is perhaps a familiar verse. Maybe you've used Romans 6.23 in sort of a Romans road approach to evangelism. It's a good verse. When it is allowed to sit in Romans 6 and we get the gravity of what sin is and our slavery under sin before we were under the reign of grace, 
And then we get the verse that leads up to it in verse 21. What benefit are you receiving from the things of which you are now ashamed? Those things result in death. But now having been freed from sin and having been enslaved to God, you have your benefit leading to sanctification and the end eternal life. And then comes Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The context helps us get the gravity of this. What does it mean the wages of sin is death? It means you showed up at your job. Not a salaried position, but a, an hourly position. And there's a, there's a time clock. And if you're old enough to remember the machine time clocks, ka-chunk, that stamped when you uh, arrived at work, and ka-chunk, they stamped the time when you left work. And you turn in your time card at the end of two weeks, and you get paid. What do you get paid for? You get paid for your time put in at the job. You, you earned it. And an employer was derelict of his duty if he didn't give you what you had earned according to your time clock and what you put in. What is the illustration here? The wages of sin is death. What what is your wage? You've been punching in a time clock all your life called sin, 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 sin. What do you get paid for that? Death. It is what you earned. It is exactly in keeping with what you did. You did sin. Here's your paycheck. It's called death. That is the totality of the human condition. Nobody's on another clock. Nobody's on another job. Nobody's on another task outside of Christ. As slaves of sin, what benefit do you derive from the things of which we Christians are now ashamed? The outcome is death. The the wage of sin is death. But notice the contrast in verse 23. But the wage of, no, it doesn't say the wage. What does it say? But the free gift of God is eternal life. It's a dramatic contrast, a contrast between death and life, but also the contrast between what is earned and what is received as a free gift. Here's the great news of the gospel. You spent your whole life clocking in sin and earning the wage of death. And when you believed in Jesus, you were given as a free gift, contrary to all those timestamps on your time card, a gift you could never earn and never deserve eternal life. And you walk out with your time card, and it does not resemble what you did. It looks totally unfamiliar. It it doesn't have all of that dirty nonsense on it. It's been wiped clean. You have been declared righteous. You've been credited God's righteousness to your account. Christian, we must never forget these things. Let's drive this nail in just a little bit farther. Titus 3, verses 5 and 6. When the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not by works which we did in righteousness, He saved us according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So you went from criminal slave, clocking in sin, earning death, to a recipient of God's grace, washed by the Holy Spirit, declared righteous because of God's love, and now made heirs of eternal life, inheritors of all that belongs to your Father. What do we have to complain about? What have we actually earned and deserved and made ourselves entitled to? Death, judgment. What have we gotten instead? Forgiveness, life, and best of all, God himself. Episcopal Bishop John Shelby Spong famously asked the question, 
Why do bad things happen to good people? You heard that question? We really should ask every day in every situation, say, why do good things happen to me? Why should any good thing happen to me? And and even thinking through this as a believer, God already forgave my sin. If not a single other good thing happens to me in this life, I have everything. Take the world, I have Jesus. Take my health, take loved ones, take whatever. If not another good thing happens to you, if you sit in the ash heap, of the rubble of what was once a pleasant life, scraping the sores with pot shards. But your sins are forgiven. You have not a thing to complain about. That is the truth. I'm saying it. I, I'm not sure I believe it. I believe it. Lord, help my unbelief. But that is the truth. And if we could see it from eternity's lens, we would say it louder. Complaining is a window into the heart. And complaining is also a doorway for other sins. Sins to come in and, and gang up on one another and then, and then spill out. Complaining is actually a portal that lets your heart out in the open. It exposes the heart. But complaining is also a portal that allows a stream of other vices in. And and there's a relationship between complaining and and other sins. If you have read Stuart Scott's Exemplary Husband, in the middle there is a section where he details manifestations of pride and manifestations of humility. You may have come across the, the short booklet version of that called From Pride to Humility. And in the first two manifestations of pride that Dr. Scott lists, complaining shows up. Complaining is very much connected to our pride. It is connected to our having a a high view of ourselves. William Plummer was a a pastor in the late 1800s. He said this, He who expects nothing because he deserves nothing is sure to be satisfied with the treatment he receives at God's hands. I'll say that one more time. He who expects nothing because he deserves nothing is sure to be satisfied with the treatment he receives at God's hands. Flip that around. You're dissatisfied with God's providential workings in your life. What does it tell you about the way you view you? What does it tell you about your self-assessment? You expect more than you deserve. And you believe you deserve better than you have. Because you're not satisfied with God's dealings. This is a high view of self. And complaining exposes my ignorance. You can turn there if you like. I'm just going to go there quickly to Jeremiah chapter 10. If you don't make it by the time I read it, that's okay. Just listen. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, I know, O Yahweh, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. What Jeremiah is getting at is we're not good enough, powerful enough, knowledgeable enough, wise enough to direct our own path. We don't have the big picture. We don't actually have God's values in God's proportions. We don't see the interworkings of all the details of the universe. We're just not smart enough to decide how our lives should go. We trust these things To God's view. Complaining says, I'm wise enough to map out my life and God's not getting it right. The the reality is, I would never choose discomforts for myself or sickness or loss. Even though looking in the rear view mirror, I can attest to you that the times that I grew fastest and bestest were in difficulty. And yet we are so quick to try to avoid difficulty. We just don't plan the way God does. What else is connected to complaining? I would suggest to you that that complaining brings into our life or provides opportunity in our life for a whole, whole host 
of other crimes. Uh, One of those is just wasted time, wasted opportunity, wasted energy. When we give ourselves to complaining, we are filling in an otherwise blank space in our life with rebelling against God in our heart. And what could be in that place, praise, worship, evangelism, productive activity, prayer for others, gratitude, which always pleases the Lord. So it's not just the negative side of complaining that is a problem, but complaining serves as a placeholder in the place of other things that would be beneficial. We end up wasting time, wasting energy, wasting opportunity when we complain. One of the byproducts of complaint is a decrease in usefulness to God and a decrease in usefulness to others. If I am complaining, I am distracted. I am consumed and I am self-focused. By its very activity, it's taking my eyes off of God and my eyes off of the needs of others. I have become self-absorbed. I have become the center of my own universe. What, what matters is what I have to complain about. And it sure would be a whole lot nicer if, if all of the other sentient beings in the universe would gather themselves around my sovereign purposes right now. It is grossly out of proportion. Another bevy of sins that come along with complaining are anger, resentment, and bitterness. If, if you're complaining, it is, it is a sign, it is a, a verbal expression of anger. I don't like what's going on. It, it is an anger directed at others. It is an anger directed vertically at God. There is resentment. There is bitterness. Resentment and bitterness are sort of the, the settled anger over time that just lounge around in the heart. Sometimes we think of anger only as outbursts, but the sort of long view seething anger can come with a smile on the face, calm demeanor, but a bitterness that will not cool. Along with complaining come jealousy, envy, and coveting. Oftentimes our complaints are are a result of, or they end up producing comparisons. And that can go either way. I see what other people are getting. I'm not getting that, so I'm going to complain. Or I have a complaining heart, and that is fuel or fertile soil for comparing my lot in life with others. There's a symbiotic relationship between envy and complaining. I think I want what others have instead of what God in his sovereign goodness has seen fit to give me. Along with all of these is a restlessness rather than a resting. It is a a desire to take matters into my own hands and and fix things that I want to complain about. Oh, I'm not going to just complain. I'm going to be a problem solver. I'm I'm going to manipulate. I'm going to control. I'm going to cut corners. I'm going to compromise. And I'm going to get what I want because I'm in charge. It is a dethroning God and an enthroning of myself that stems from a restlessness of heart. I don't like the situation I'm in. I'm going to do something about it. The grass is greener somewhere else, so I'm going to go there. I'm going to take the reins of the universe. I'm going to shortcut faith. I'm going to compromise on things that I know are sinful because the end justifies the means. And and I can get what I'm sure would be good if I just cut this corner. Complaining truly reveals what we treasure. When I am in complaint mode, I ask, what am I not getting that I want? This is what I should be asking of myself. What am I not getting that I'm expecting? What am I not getting that I think I deserve? And learning to ask myself that question is a tremendous help. If you can identify an inordinate desire with the, with the hopes of uprooting complaint... You are well down the path. What am I getting that I want? Or what am I not getting that I think I want? Sometimes you might be wanting something that's really good. Something that God says would be a blessing. But he doesn't consider it to be good for you right now. 
And I think this is the the trial we face when we're looking for a job, when we want to be married, when we would love to have children, when we want to get into college, when there are big decisions in life that are responsible things, good things, blessings. And yet in God's providence, it's it's not good for me now. This is Psalm 8411. God does not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. Categorical statement describing those who belong to him, and God says he's not stingy. He's actually gracious and generous, but he's good and wise, and he knows what we need when we need it. He he knows us better than we know ourselves, and he loves his children. Complaining gets that equation backwards. I know what I need. I know what I deserve. Along with complaining comes increasing ingratitude. Complaining flows from a lack of gratitude in the heart, but a habit of complaining produces a vicious cycle, producing greater ingratitude. If you teach yourself that you are a victim of God's dealings or other people's dealings, you will then become blind to God's good dealings with you in the present. You will become blind to the many graces of God through others in your life. You will become blind to the benefits of trials. You may even become blind to the relief that God gives you in your difficulty. The very thing you're complaining about, God may give you relief. But if you have taught yourself to complain, you will not see it when it comes. You will not be grateful for the relief when it is there. You have taught yourself to complain and you will complain about the next scenario. It is a vicious cycle. And so complaining makes the best days unbearable. And it makes hard days even more intolerable. You find that you can't worship God for his undeserved gifts. You don't benefit from the good that he intends to bring through difficulty. That makes your trials even harder. And it makes you miss the joys that God brings. So consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials. That joy becomes totally elusive in a complaining heart. If you do not check complaining in the heart, you will carve a complaining rut in the ground. That just becomes the easy track to drive in. Up at Lee's Ferry in the Grand Canyon, uh, you can still see the wagon wheel ruts of the 1800s Mormon travelers who went through there. It was the the only place you could take a a sloping approach to the Colorado River for miles and miles and miles in both directions. Before there was Lake Powell, it was just a a much bigger, longer canyon. And, And you couldn't get across this big gaping hole in the ground except at Lee's Ferry. And so the the Mormons uh, who were settling the West, who believed they had to be married in the temple, uh, the poor polygamists had to make this trek over and over and over again to get another wife and marry her in Salt Lake City. But they, they drove their wagons through this place. And in solid rock, you can still see the wagon ruts. Because it was much easier to, to go where other wagon wheels had gone before. There are a series of places throughout the United States where you can still see the wagon ruts from the Oregon Trail. Maybe you've gone and seen some of those. And you can imagine slogging through uh, muddy tracks and sinking into the mire, and the next wagon just had an easier time going through the previous tracks. And, And those tracks are still there. You can make a rut, a track, that's easy to stay in. You can habituate ingratitude and complaining in the heart. That just makes it easier to do day in and day out. You've heard practice makes perfect. You know it doesn't. Because if you practice it wrong, it's not getting any better. The reality is practice makes permanent. And so to, to solve a complaining heart means we, we need to get out of the rut. And, and sometimes getting out of the rut is a lot of hard work at the front end. To make a new track. If you practice complaining unchecked, you will perfect it. You'll just get better at it. You'll normalize it. You'll justify it. Uh, It won't feel wrong to you after a while. It just becomes the language. Complaining is dangerously contagious. Uh, This church felt that in 2014. 
there were fractures in our society along racial lines that this church didn't know and then was introduced to the outside sources and fractures came here. It was a really remarkable illustration of the dangerously contagious reality of wrong thinking. And complaining is contagious. And complaining is easy. Complaining is easy. It is edifying that takes work. It is unity and love and speaking the truth to one another in love that, that takes hard work and consistency. Medieval stone castles in Europe took years to build. Uh, the, the typical small castle build was at least a decade just for the stone structure. And on average, 3,000 workers. But that same size castle can be taken down in a day by one guy with a wrecking ball. <laughs> Lies come easy. Truth is more of a challenge. Faith is hard work. Unbelief's easy. Gratitude is tough. Ingratitude comes natural. Self-control is difficult. Spewing from the lips is easy. Complaining is the native language of the human heart. The process of sanctification has to do battle with many things. But the sins beneath and around the language of complaint ought to be in the crosshairs of our sanctification work regularly. It's just so easy to go there. I feel it. Here's a fourth question. What does complaining reveal about my theology? What does complaining reveal about my theology? You have to understand that complaint in the heart is fundamentally vertical. Another way to ask this question is, what does my complaining say about my God? What am I declaring about God when I complain? Turn to Jude, that little one chapter, one page book right before Revelation, near the end of your Bible. Look at verse 14. But Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, also prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, that last phrase is what I want us to look at for a moment. All those hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Harsh things, or literally hard words. It's the word scleros, uh, the, the hardening of the heart, arteriosclerosis, that kind of thing. It, it is hard words against God. And, and I want you to think about the, the hard things we say against God when we complain. Complain about our circumstances. Complain about God's dealings. We say in one sense that God is not strong. God isn't strong. God, why isn't God taking care of this? He, I'm up against something that's just too hard. This is the refrain of Exodus 14. Verses 10 to 12 where the... Israel's army was cornered. Uh, they were in that dead end in the wilderness and Pharaoh's army was hot on their trail and they had the, the, the desert behind them and Pharaoh's army coming down and they had the impenetrable sea before them. Listen to the words of Exodus 14. And this truly is a libel Against God's power. Verse 10. Pharaoh drew near. The sons of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very afraid. And they cried out to Yahweh. Look down at verse 11. They said to Moses. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt. That you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. What is this you have done against us. In bringing us out of Egypt. 
Is not this the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Remember when they said that? Remember when they were enslaved and, and the command was more bricks, no straw. And, and the people just said, we love it here. Moses said, let my people go. And they said, no, we like it. Remember that? I don't remember that either. They've rewritten history. They've rewritten theology. Verse 12, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than for us to die in the wilderness. Who said they were going to die? You see what complaining does? Complaining exaggerates the problem, overstates the difficulty, and puts God in a corner that he can't do anything about it. He's powerless. The only possibility for us here is just to die. So why'd you bring us out here? This is a libel on God's power. In our complaining, we also may put a libel against God's wisdom. Look at Numbers 11. Verse 5. Sons of Israel wept. We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. (laughs) Free fish, really? (laughs) Weren't you slaves? The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. God doesn't know what's best. What what would be best for me is, is to still be a slave in Egypt and have garlic. We also, in our complaining, may make a libel against God's goodness. Uh, we, we begin to resent God and be bitter against God. God. God's out to get me. Turn to number 16. Verse 12, Moses sent a summons to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, we will not come up. Is it not enough that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to put us to death in the wilderness, but that you would also lord it over us? Now, that's just interesting phraseology. What did they call Egypt? A land flowing with milk and honey. Where did they get that language? They got that language from how God described the place he was taking them. Uh, They've taken God's language about what really is good, They applied it to their old circumstances that they were in slavery and just got rescued from. They're saying God is not good. He's not good to to have brought us out of a land flowing with milk and honey and, and to put Moses over us. He brought us out here to kill us, they said. That is not why God brought them out. But this complaining is a libel on God's person, his purpose, his power, and his provision. Question five for us this morning. We need to ask, what does complaining reveal about my faith? Turn to the book of Exodus, verse 15. Because complaining in the heart says something about belief. It says something about the condition of your faith. What does your faith look like? What is it stayed? And and we're just going to take a little bit of a field trip here through the complaining generations of Israel. Exodus 15, 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea, and the choicest of his officers are sunk in the Red Sea. This is the the song extolling all that God has just done. Uh, One chapter later, chapter 16, verse 2. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. So, They complained when they got trapped by Pharaoh. Pharaoh got trapped under the Red Sea. The people rescued again. And a few verses later, they're complaining. Look at verse 7. In the morning, you'll see the glory of Yahweh, for he hears your grumblings against Yahweh. They're grumbling and Yahweh hears it. Verse 8. This will happen when Yahweh gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. Yahweh hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him And what are we? Your grumblings are not against Moses and Aaron, but against Yahweh. 
Verse 9, Moses said to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, Come near before Yahweh, he has heard your grumblings. Verse 12, Yahweh says, I've heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel, speak to them. At twilight you will eat meat, in the morning you will be filled with bread, so that you will know that I am Yahweh your God. So it happened at evening, the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. Chapter 17, verse 3. The people thirsted for water and they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt? Short memories. Turn to Numbers chapter 11. Verse 1. Now the people became like those who complain of calamity in the ears of Yahweh. And Yahweh heard it and his anger was kindled. Chapter 14, verse 2. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in the wilderness. Verse 27. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, which they are making against me. Verse 29. Your corpses will fall in the wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Verse 36, as for the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land and who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing out a bad report. Verse 30, uh, chapter 16, verse 11. Therefore, you and all your congregation are gathered together against Yahweh. But as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble against him? Verse 41. The next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, you are the ones who have caused the death of the people of Yahweh. Chapter 17, verse 5. It will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Thus, I will rid myself of the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. Verse 10. Yahweh said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels that you may put an end to their grumblings against me so that they will not die. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 27. Deuteronomy 1 27. And you grumbled in your tents and you said, because Yahweh hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of of the Amorites to destroy us. Joshua 9.18. Joshua 9.18 says, The sons of Israel did not strike them down because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by Yahweh the God of Israel, and the whole congregation grumbled against the leaders. What does all of this depict? It it becomes tiresome to read of the grumbling over and over and over again until you stop and recognize, I have probably complained in my heart uh, more than I just read of the accounts of the wilderness wandering Israelites in the last week. Their 40 years compared to my last 40 days. We ought to be stopped short before we throw stones But what's fascinating is God calls them rebels in their grumbling and talks about their unbelief. There's a psalm, Psalm 106, that looks back to this generation. And look at this description, Psalm 106, verse 24. They despised the pleasant land... They did not believe in his word. They grumbled in their tents and they did not listen to the voice of Yahweh. Those are stunning indictments. They despised good things. They didn't believe God's good word. They grumbled in their tents. Seems private. It's very public in heaven. And they did not listen to his voice. What were they listening to? themselves and each other. They were deaf to God. 
I want you to see some connections because this, this wilderness wandering, complaining generation it becomes something of a negative monument throughout scripture. Look at Psalm 95. Beginning in the last line of verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days of Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers tried me, they tested me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said they are a people who wander in their hearts. They do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger They will not enter my rest. It's a stunning indictment from God. Looking back on that generation, it was a generation of unbelief, rejecting goodness, hardening their hearts and trying the Lord. They they wore out his patience. This, This is a God who is very, 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 very patient. And they wore it out. Turn to Hebrews chapter three. Or listen as I read verse 12. See to it, brothers, that there is not in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Verse 15. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. The writer to Hebrews is warning Christians don't have an evil, unbelieving heart. What's the illustration of evil, unbelief? Complaining in the wilderness. Provoking God by complaint. And one last connection, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse 10. Do not grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened as an example written for our instruction. What do we learn about complaining? It is rebellion. We learn that complaining is unbelief. We learn that complaining provokes God. And you need to know, question number five, where does a complaining heart end up? A complaining heart in the short term leads to a bitter life. William Plummer said, the ambitious man will be content with nothing gained because each elevation widens his horizon and gives him a view of something else that he longs for. So he is tossed from vanity to vanity He's a stranger to solid peace. And he says, are you ambitious? Then you are your own tormentor. You're not content with what God has for you right now. You're looking for something else. It's a vain chase for the something else and the something else. And you are your own tormentor. If you are a complainer. Jeremiah Burroughs said, you who are discontented, Lift up your hearts against God. You cause God to lift up his hand against you. Perhaps God lays his finger on you softly in some afflictions and you cannot bear the hand of God. It would be just for God to lift up his hand against you in another kind of affliction. Oh, a murmuring spirit provokes God exceedingly. In Psalm 106, the Psalm we just looked at there, there are further sins that complaint leads to. This tried God's patience, but the result for the sinner was opening a portal to other sins. And in Psalm 106, it's described this way. He made their seed fall among the nations, scattered them in the lands. Then they joined themselves to Baal Peor, and they ate sacrifices offered to the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their actions, and the plague broke out. What did complaining lead to? More sin, idolatry, the worship of other gods. There's a very real danger when complaining is a symptom of rebellion and unbelief that unchecked complaining allows rebellion and unbelief to go unchecked. And it might reveal that you have never yet experienced the grace of God in the gospel. It might be a reef that shipwrecks faith. Or it might be a crippling entanglement in your Christian life that turns your Christian race into a hampered slog through a miry bog. 
slow, ineffective, unfruitful, missing out on rewards, missing out on joy. What are some cures for a complaining heart? Maybe you need the gospel. If complaining is your native language, you never thought of speaking anything else, this may be an opportunity for you to have seen into your own heart and realize, I need to be rescued. (laughs) If I'm rescued from the burden of my sin and the slavery of my sin and the consequences of my sin unchecked, I, I can have my sins forgiven today and I can have joy that I've never known about. And maybe seeing complaining in your heart is a, is a window into a more desperate need. One cure for complaint is just the correction of entitlement. John Street in his book, Passions of the Heart, lists entitlement as fertile ground for other sins. You're discontent, you're complaining, that opens the door for, in, in his book, all kinds of sexual immorality, inordinate desires. Entitlement keeps you restless until your expectations are met. So learn to get rid of the entitlement mentality. You can trace much complaining to the idolatry of unmet expectations rooted in sinful entitlement. You believe you deserve something, you're owed something, you're not getting from God or from others, you're going to take it to yourself. We plead our rights, something we think we have a just claim to. I have a right to be happy, to be comfortable, to be prosperous, whatever it is. And we have to replace entitlement mentality with the gospel. A right view of God, a right view of ourselves, promoting gratitude. Learn to cultivate gratitude. Learn to contemplate eternity. I'm just going to rattle off some cures here. You can trace them out yourself. Reintroduce yourself to the attributes of God. Contemplating the love of God goes a long way to defeat complaint in the heart. God's love is initiating, justifying, adopting. Contemplate other attributes of God. His goodness, His sovereignty, His providence, His purposes. Think again about Romans 8, 28. The things we're tempted to complain about come under the banner of all things that God is causing to work together for our good. Jeremiah Burroughs said, Perhaps God sees it is better for you to live in a continual dependence upon Him and not to know what your condition will be tomorrow than for you to have a more settled condition in terms of creature comforts. It might actually be God's good for you to have you be unsettled so that you trust Him, so that you remain humble and useful. I'll quote Sarah Demarest. I don't know if this originated with you, Sarah, but I'm going to say it here. If I were as kind and good as God, then I would have chosen this situation for myself as well. If I were as kind and good as God, then I would have chosen this situation for myself. That is a good remedy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you have done We cannot express our gratitude uh, too well or too often. And every expression would come short of what you have truly done. But help us to ever and always think about who we were apart from Christ, what we deserved, and what we get instead in you. Covered in your love, adopted into your family, guaranteed of eternal inheritance with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.